Thank you so much for joining today and welcome to our live chat. I'll get my camera on here. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Tucker and I am a development officer at Grooming Foundation and I've been here for about two years. This summer I had an opportunity, a very special opportunity to travel to Africa and visit our programs there. And so today I'll be taking you on that trip with me the best way I can. Um, I am calling you from Washington, D.C. Um, so we're going to take a virtual trip together um, to, to Africa. So again, thank you so much for joining. I'm really excited to share some stories with you from my trip. I met some really wonderful people this summer, and I know you'll enjoy getting to know them as well. First, I want to show you um, kind of a map of where I was this summer. You can see the highlighted green countries on the map. If you look on the left, the first country you see is Ghana, which is the first country I visited. Then go to the bottom and Zambia is highlighted. And then move back up and to the right and you'll see Uganda. Those are the three countries I visited, three countries where Grameen Foundation has work, and um, three countries where you'll meet some very special people from today. And I would actually love to find out where you're calling from today. So if you can, um, in your window on the right side, there's a panel where you can type in questions or you can chat. If you'll type in where you're from in that panel and your name, I'd love to give you a shout out, just greet you. Thank you for being here and we'd love to know where you're calling in from today. The first country I will take you on a virtual tour through is Ghana. In Ghana, we do uh, health work using mobile phones. You can see a quick description of what we're doing there on your screen. We've been working with the Ghana Health Service, which is the national health care in Ghana, to bring people important um, health information directly to their mobile phone. So, so many people in Ghana live away from a clinic, away from places where they can access health information, but many, many people have mobile phones. Um, a recent statistic came out showing that people in the developing world, there are more mobile phones than flushable toilets. And after visiting some of these countries this summer, I can definitely believe that's true. So um, mobile phones give us a big opportunity to reach people who don't have access to traditional resources that we're used to, like hospitals, banks, other things like that. So in Ghana, we're taking advantage of these cell phones and we are sending women, particularly women um, who are pregnant or who have just given birth, information to help their maternal neonatal health be better so that they can make good choices, raise healthy children, and um, have better livelihoods ultimately um, with less time sick. The first person I would like to introduce you to very briefly here is named Fatima. And this picture you can see is a picture of Fatima being enrolled in Mobile Midwife, which is the mobile phone program that we have for pregnant mothers and new mothers in Ghana. The nurse on the left is named Irene. Irene is currently enrolling Fatima in Mobile Midwife. So Irene is using a cell phone, her cell phone, and Fatima's cell phone to enroll Fatima um, she'll, she'll note when Fatima had her baby so that the messages Fatima receives are in sync with where she is in her pregnancy or in this case in her child's stages of development. This picture was taken one day after Fatima's baby was born. Um, her baby didn't even have a name yet when we met her. And so she'll be getting really helpful information as she goes along. Another thing that's important to note is that Fatima is not literate. Fatima cannot read a calendar, and I don't believe she had a calendar. So something else she'll be able to do through Mobile Midwife is know when she has appointments so she can always be caught up on her immunizations and always know when she needs to go to the clinic. And so again, um, just, to, just to reiterate, I guess, um, these women's cell phones do receive messages directly to them based on where they are in their pregnancy or their child's life. And important to note, these messages can be text messages, so they can be written messages that these women can read, or they can be voice messages for women who are not literate. And they'll be recorded in their local language. There are many local languages in Ghana. They'll be recorded in the correct language for these women, so these women can actually use this information. So it's actionable and they can 
um, immediately start using it to, to improve their health. This picture here on the screen right now is a picture of Helena. Helena is 19 years old. She's a new mother. This is her first child, and she is a single mother. She enrolled in Mobile Midwife about five months into her pregnancy and began getting messages through her cell phone, and it helped her make her clinic appointments much, much better. It helped her remember to go in. It helped her know that she needed immunizations to prevent malaria and other problems. And so she ended up giving birth to a very healthy baby girl named Clara. Clara is about five months old in this picture, I believe. Um, and Helena also learned some really important things about keeping Clara healthy once she gave birth. She learned that she needed to keep a treated mosquito net over their bed so that Clara wouldn't be as susceptible to malaria. She learned that she needed to just only breastfeed for the first few months of Clara's life so that Clara wouldn't get any bugs or, or pathogens from the water um, that is traditional, traditionally given to babies, which can be unhealthy and can cause problems. So Helena learned a lot from Mobile Midwife and, and was very grateful to have it. This is where Helena lives. It's pretty far away from a big city. It's pretty isolated. Um, very simple homes and, and most of her um, community members are farmers. I'll move forward. And this is a photo of her with her mother. Her mother is a fetish priestess and practices traditional medicine. Her mother gave birth to 12 children, never stepping foot in a health clinic, all by herself. Um, her mother, at the beginning of her pregnancy, Helena's mother, her name is Hannah, Hannah gave Helena um, traditional medicine in the form of herbal drinks and enemas. And while this didn't harm Helena, it could have. Um, it's not very safe. And so having access to sound, science-based medical information helped Helena have a healthier pregnancy. Interestingly, Hannah, even though she practices traditional medicine and is a community leader, um, she was thrilled for Helena to be enrolled in this program. She's been giving out traditional advice for years because it was the best thing that her community had. But now that they have access to better information, She's very happy that her daughter used that information and that other young women in her community can use that information as well. Here's one last picture of little Clara, very sweet baby. So I'd like to say hello to a few people. We have Tyler calling in from New York. We have callers from the United Kingdom, from Elizabethtown. And others, keep submitting your, um, your, where you're calling in from and your name. I'd love to say hello. Um, the next town I want to visit with you virtually is a town called Mumford in Ghana. This town looked very beautiful when we drove up to it. It's on the coast. Um, you can see there are boats everywhere. It's a beautiful coastline. And when we looked closer, we noticed that the town was not in very good shape. Um, there was a very big sanitation problem. Poverty seemed particularly bad there. Um, it was a very poor community, and it was, it was really kind of rotting, um, to borrow the words of one of my colleagues. While we were there, we saw children playing in the dirt with trash multiple times. Some of them weren't fully clothed. Um, so it was really a, um, a place that needed some help. And luckily, Grooming Foundation is there offering some help um, through Mobile No Life. So we met this woman, her name is Letitia. She was very gracious and very warm as soon as we walked up. She is a fishmonger, so you can see from the photo, she is smoking fish um, on a, a homemade, a handmade um, smoker. She had been married before um, and had a very sad story. Her first husband had beat her, um, he had abandoned her. And she held out hope for a long time that he would come back to her and care for her and her children, um, their children. But he didn't. Very happily for her, she met another man, and she said he is a very good man. And she got remarried, and she has um, now a baby on the way with her new husband. The time we took these photos, she was nine months pregnant. So now she's given birth to, um, to a little baby, 
I believe, a baby girl. Um, and she was, she was thrilled. Um, part of the sadness of her story was that she had lost one of her children by her first husband to chickenpox, something very, very treatable, but she waited too long to take him to the clinic, and by the time she took him in, it was too late to save him. So for her, having access to this medical information that could help her prevent more problems like that was really helpful. She has now a line to healthcare, to nurses, to clinicians who can help her avoid these problems and avoid that same devastation that she's had in the past. And she was so happy and so hopeful for the future of her children. Um, she said, we asked her what she would like to leave behind for her children, what her goal was. And she said she and her husband are working to leave them behind a business that they can take up and, and earn money and live more comfortably. Um, that is her life goal. I'd like to encourage you now to submit questions. Um, there is, again, on that panel on the right side of your screen, um, or it may be the bottom of your screen depending on your setup, there is a panel where you can submit questions. Please type those in, submit them. I will answer as many as I can at the end of this webinar. Um, and, and any question is absolutely fine. Just send it our way and we'll answer as many as we can. Um, you're welcome to send them as we go or wait until the end and um, submit them now. So then, so um, please go ahead and submit them if you have them. Next country we'll visit is Zambia. In Zambia, our work is a little bit different. Um, we have an investment in Zambia in a socially conscious business called Zona. It's spelled Z-O-O-N-A, and it's pronounced Zona. Zona's goal is to create a cashless Africa, but what they're doing is reaching out to people who live in rural areas who don't have access to banks, and even to people living in cities who don't have the education and, and really don't feel comfortable going in a bank. Um, I did go in a bank in Zambia to try to withdraw some cash, and it was actually very intimidating. Um, environment to be in. So many people are not comfortable in banks and many other people just don't have access to banks. So it's really hard for them to transact, um, to send money between each other, to um, have businesses, etc. It's very difficult to work on a cash-only basis. Um, something that's very common in Zambia and around Africa and around the developing world really is remittances. So there are many people who live in cities who are fortunate enough to have jobs, and often there aren't enough jobs to go around. So those who do have jobs are sending money to their family members who haven't had the same good fortune. So that means you might have a job in the city working for the government, and every week you send an allowance to your aunt in the countryside who only makes money selling a few vegetables and really can't keep her head above water. It's a really important, um, it's, it's important to these people and it's an important way to help people climb out of poverty and um, it's something that, that needs to be improved and Zona is working to do that, to, to be able to include people in the financial mainstream and be sure that people can have healthier financial lives. One of, the, um, one of the Zona, this is actually um, a teller working at a Zona booth. Um, we met was named Frida. So she comes to work every day in this bright green booth. Zona's color is bright green. There are thousands of booths around the country of Zambia, and they're growing now. They'll be in Malawi soon and maybe Zimbabwe, so they'll, they'll expand even more. But right now they cover all of Zambia, and this young woman, Frida, is working in a community that does not have a bank. It was pretty poor. It was outside of the capital city of Lusaka and um, there was really nowhere else for people to go to get rid of their cash or withdraw money or any other financial transaction. So Frida is working at this booth to provide people with that service. She had a very interesting story herself. She was unemployed for several years after high school. She did complete her high school education and could speak English very well, but didn't have a job for years and years, um, for about two years actually, until she got a job with Zona. So in addition to helping people get access to financial services, like withdrawing and sending money, um, Zona is creating jobs, thousands of jobs around the country. Um, 
people, entrepreneurs can start these Zona booths. They can hire other people to work in them. So it's really a job creator and it's really boosting the economy as well. Frida had a, a kind of sad story. She wanted to go to college. Um, she didn't get to do that. Her father died right as she was graduating high school. He was trying to build her family a home and he died while it was being built. So she took out a loan to finish the home and as a result has been paying back that loan for years and has not been able to further her education. She would like to go to school in South Africa and be a journalist for the BBC, preferably. And she is saving up money every week to make that happen, um, working toward that goal. We heard all of her story and then at the very end, we asked her to step out of her booth and um, let us get a picture. And we found out she's also pregnant. So, Again, this is a young woman who didn't have a job, she's pregnant, she's saddled with debt to help her family. She told us her mother sells vegetables at a roadside stall and doesn't make much money, and her brother doesn't have a job. So she is, she is the income source for her family, and it's because Zona gave her a job. And at the same time, she can feel good about serving people in her community who need to have access to um, to a bank, a kind of bank, to financial resources and services they didn't have before. Next up in Zambia is another Zona client, and um, his story is a little different. His name is Terry. Terry is a distributor of Coca-Cola, as you can see. Um, he has a shipping container, which is square in the middle of a, a marketplace, the very busy marketplace, and he sells Coca-Cola products out of the back of the shipping container. He um, just had one shipping container and was having a hard time running his business, making it work. He used to have to shut down, shut his doors one day a week for almost a whole day to go to Zambian breweries, which produces the Coca-Cola, and to pay them for his next week's stock. So he lost a lot of business. It was a big opportunity cost just closing down his building or his, his shipping container, his storefront, and, um, and going to have that transaction. Now there is a Zona kiosk right in front of his, um, of his distribution center. So he can shut down for about 30 minutes, take the cash he's given by his customers, deposit it there, and not be worried about having cash on hand. He can also send money to Zambian breweries to buy more Coca-Cola stock without having to get on a bus, pay a bus fare, drive far away to give it to them. So it simplified his life so much and it makes having his business so much easier. Um, he has been robbed before. Before Zona existed, he was robbed because he had so much cash on hand in his business and he had nowhere to take it and no way to close down to take it. It was too big of a risk. So he was robbed. Um, with Zona's help, he was actually given a small loan through Zona to recover that loss, um, to build his business back up and to get back on his feet. And as a result of that, he's opened a second um, storefront where his wife works so that he can earn more money. In his household, um, it's he and his wife, they have three children age one year old to eight years old, and it sounded like they planned to have more. He also has two of his siblings and a niece living in his household. So he's a very common story of people um, caring for others and their family, um, because again, there aren't enough jobs to go around. But thanks to Zona and thanks to you as a supporter, um, making it possible, he now has um, a more a healthier business and, and he's doing better and he's even employing other people in addition to his wife. So it's really helped his business get off the ground. Last country I visited was Uganda. And I visited two program areas in Uganda. So I'll tell you a little about both. Um, again, before I get started, if you have questions about our work in Ghana, our health work, or our work in Zambia with Zona, or any of our other programs, if you're just curious about them or how they connect, please submit them now. Um, again, you just type, there's a question and a chat column on your screen. You can just type in those questions and, um, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. And it looks like we'll have probably a good half hour to answer your questions. So please submit them now. 
So in Uganda, the first program we visited was our, um, it was a savings program. And what Grameen Foundation does with this program is um, actually very, very interesting and, and um, I'm excited to tell you about it. We work with savings groups that already exist, um, like this one. This one was all women, um, actually all women with one young man in it. Um, the groups can be women and men, um, but they are all over the country of Uganda and other countries as well. They're pretty common. These are groups of people that meet together and save their money each week. So, so let's say every Tuesday afternoon the group comes together to meet and you put in, in the collective savings pool, you put in what money you have left over from your sales of your harvest for the week to save it. Um, so it's just financial preparedness. But something this group also does is giving, gives each other small loans. So if you are just having a hard time, maybe your crops didn't grow very well or you got a bad price for them, but you need to pay school fees or you need to buy more seeds, you can do that through this group. They'll extend you a loan. You, um, you just share your need. They'll vote on it as a group. Um, you'll take out a loan, then you can pay it back um, with a little bit of interest. You pay it back over time to the group. So it's a really effective way for these communities to um, extend financial services to one another because, again, banks are few and far between um, in Uganda, just as in Zambia, and it's important for um, people to have ways to save money, um, take out loans, and, and, and be preparing for their futures and, and making better businesses. So what Grameen Foundation is doing with these groups is helping them streamline what they're doing, doing it better and safer. So right now, you can see on the picture, there's a big green box kind of in the foreground of the picture. And it's metal, and right now it's got a lot of cash money in it. Um, at the time I visited this group, they were just transitioning to the new Grameen Foundation system. So it's a very new, very new program that we have. Um, the money in that box is taken home by a different member of the group every week and hidden. So it's a little risky, right? They're um, taking money in a box and trying to hide it, but the box is big enough that it would be easy to find and, and it would be very easy to rob the group. And there's quite a bit of money in there. Um, they do yearly saving cycles, so, um, so it could be very risky and very dangerous. So um, one of Grameen Foundation's um, initiatives is to help them not have to have cash on hand anymore. So even though there are lots, or there are not lots of banks, there are lots of cell phone kiosks around the country. Uh, the biggest cell phone provider in Uganda, or one of the biggest, is called Airtel Money. And there are Airtel Money agents all over the place. So these Airtel Money agents are, can collect, are now trained, and, and certified to collect the money from the savings groups so that they don't have to keep it in their box for long periods of time anymore. So even though they can't get to a bank, they still have a way to deposit their cash so that it's safer. Um, so another, another, I'll actually go back a slide. This woman in this photo is named Karanga and she is holding a huge paper ledger, which is where all of the documentation, all of the records for these groups their savings and loans are kept. Um, it's very much prone to accounting errors. It could be eaten. It could be stolen or lost. It's not a very safe system for keeping track of such important information. So something else Grameen Foundation has done is created something with the partnership of Barclays Bank, which is a very large bank in Uganda, um, created something called LedgerLink, which is a mobile phone app which lets these groups better manage, manage their finances, calculate their totals and savings and loans, and, and really get rid of that paper ledger that can cause so many problems. The, um, the application is, the app is through a smartphone, so the group takes out a loan for the smartphone and then they pay it back. They buy the smartphone so that they can have access to this source, resource, um, which keeps them keeps them accountable, it keeps them um, interested in using it. Um, and another app that, um, that we've developed with Airtel, the mobile phone operator, is called Chama Wallet. So everyone in the group can have kind of a mobile money wallet, like a little bit like PayPal or ePesa, something they can use to 
um, manage their balance, um, something that's very user-friendly for them to um, see where they are in their savings and their financial goals. So this group here is a focus group. Again, we got to visit this right at the end of its development, and we've just launched it, and it's been um, really great, very successful so far. Um, that's my colleague there on the right in the black striped shirt who is um, doing one last focus group to see if the app, the Airtel Chama wallet app, is useful to the people in the room. And the people in that room are, some of them are literate, some are illiterate, um, a couple of them are leaders, a couple of them are just group members. So it's a pretty diverse crowd in front of them. This young lady in pink is named Fatuma. And Fatuma is a mother of three. She's 28 years old, and she's a member of the savings group. She is saving up for her children's education. We um, had a few moments to talk to Fatuma and ask her um, about her past and about why she's saving and what her goals are. And she told us in her interview that her parents didn't care about education. And even if they had, she probably couldn't have gone very far in school because they didn't have very much money. She said it with so much sadness, um, looking at the ground, it was, it was very hard to listen to. It was obviously very hard for her. But her primary goal in saving money is so that she can send every single one of her children to school. Her husband has other wives, um, which is pretty common in this community. And his other wives um, have children as well, and she knows that she alone is responsible for sending her children to school. She won't count on anyone else, so she's been saving her money very diligently. She works on her mother-in-law's farmland, um, which she's very, she feels very fortunate to be able to do, and she sells what she farms to traders who come through their village um, to make money. So she's working very, very hard, um, and again, just, just solely for the purpose of giving her children a better life. This photo shows her, um, one of her group members and friends, Harriet, um, drawing on her thumb with ink, with an ink pen, because Fatuma was not literate. She couldn't sign a photo release form um, we asked her to sign so that we ha would have permission to use her photo. Um, so again, a lot of sadness, because it was very clear from hearing Fatuma speak that she was a very intelligent young woman, um, and that she really wanted better things for her children than she had for herself. There's one last photo of her with her little girl. And our last program area, again, get your questions in, and I'll be answering them shortly, is our Community Knowledge Workers Program. This program was actually personally my favorite to visit. Um, all of our programs were really incredible and inspiring and helping so many people, but this one, um, you walked away from it with just the best feeling, so much hope for the future of these people in this country. Um, it was really wonderful. So the Community Knowledge Worker Program is a program that helps farmers access information that can help them earn more money from their farms. And the way it works is a Community Knowledge Worker is a person living in a community who is elected by her or his peers as a community leader. The Community Knowledge Worker once they're elected, they um, take out a small loan and buy a smartphone that's preloaded with a database full of information about um, local agriculture, so um, both plants and animals. So you can tell, so for example, if you have a purple udder on your cow, you can look up the symptoms that you're seeing and find out what the problem is and how it can be treated. And that's something many of us take for granted. We have Google, we have phones and computers and so many ways to access information um, right in the moment we need it. And that's something that's not available to everyone. But in Uganda, we have thousands of community knowledge workers who are deployed, who are helping get this information to people. So community knowledge workers, once they have this phone with this information, they use it themselves by all means, but they also visit their neighbors and help their neighbors figure out their problems, figure out how they could earn more money. They can find out where a better market to earn money is. So maybe one mile east, you can make twice as much money as you could going one mile west. And that's information they just had no way to know before, except through word of mouth, which was too slow. So community knowledge workers visit their neighbors, 
help them improve their farms and earn more money. And it's been really, really effective and, and really, really positive so far. Um, I have just one story from this program for you, and it's, um, I think, my favorite story from the whole trip, um, because this woman you see on the screen, Florence, was the warmest and most hospitable and, and joyful person, I think, in the world, maybe. Um, she was really incredible. We drove up to her house, and she was literally bent over a ditch, digging with her hands in the dirt, trying to make an irrigation ditch for her farm. So again, she's, she's literally digging in her hands with her hands in the dirt. She looks up and sees us, and she has a huge smile on her face, and she runs over to greet us. So even though she's doing just backbreaking labor, and she's in her 50s, um, it can't be easy, she's, she's so warm and so glad to see us. Um, I, was, I am also pleased to tell you that the community knowledge worker who was accompanying us in the car to visit Florence had brought her a tool to help her dig the stitch, um, just as a friend lending her the tool. So um, I think her day got a little better after that, I'm, I'm happy to say. Um, Florence has had a very sad life. Um, she's like Fatuma, her husband has multiple wives. And she has six children, and she's had to raise them on her own. Her husband abandoned her altogether and left her with the children. So she's been farming for several years. She was once a teacher, but she was laid off from teaching, and she's just been farming ever since. She used to live in a small, small hut on her land made of um, just mud and sticks with a thatched roof. Um, and again, so small, it would it's hard to imagine even sleeping in it, much less living in it all the time. But since she has more money and has advice from her local community knowledge worker, she's built a two-room house made of, of mud, good solid mud walls with a roof over her head. Um, so she's living so much better and she's so much happier. Some of you might have seen Mary in the spring. Mary is the community knowledge worker we interviewed in another webinar. And Mary is actually Florence's community knowledge worker. So Florence couldn't stop talking about Mary's, just the wonders of Mary and how much information Mary had brought her that's changed her life. Florence used to have chickens. And one time, she lost 12 chickens in one single day to something called Newcastle disease. That's very deadly and very contagious. Florence lost all of these chickens, but all the while it was completely preventable through a pretty inexpensive immunization. So once Mary found out what problem Florence was having, Mary told her, you can go here, you can immunize your chickens, and it won't happen again. Florence bought some more chickens, had them immunized, and has not had the problem. She's doing much better. She also learned that she could plant her banana trees further apart and have better banana bunches to sell. And since she did that, she earns much more money for each banana bunch that she sells because just that simple step of planting your trees further apart can just increase the yield so much. And this is all information from Mary's mobile phone that Mary brought to Florence to help her out. So Florence's two oldest children, again, she has six children. The two oldest did not get to finish school. Um, she didn't have the money at the time, and, and they got married and moved off, and they're out of the house. But the four younger children are all in school, and Florence intends for all of them to finish school, and she hopes they'll go to college, too. And she'll continue supporting them through school, and I think as much as she can through college, um, she's determined for them to be able to finish school and be able to do more things. Um, in Florence, we asked her what would be a good life, what would she like, um, to happen if she had plenty of money, if she kept earning more money. She told us she would like to hire somebody, um, give them a job for help on her farm, and she said if she really got enough money, she'd like to grow fat. Um, she works so hard every day in the fields that she doesn't always have time to cook herself dinner at night because it's a lot of work working with the raw materials to cook them. So she's not always full when she goes to bed or wakes up, and she would love to have a life where she can have a little more time to relax and, um, and eat a little bit better. And we think that she will meet that goal. She is um, doing so much better and, and really earning more money from her farm. 
Um, before we left, she, she insisted we take away some mangoes from her mango tree. Um, and just one last photo, there I am with Florence. Um, again, she really had a strong impact on me, so um, I was really, really happy to meet her and get a photo with her to remember her by. So the last story I'd like to tell is your story. Um, because you made all of these stories possible, you are enabling good things to happen all across Africa and Asia and Latin America. Every time you make a gift to Grooming Foundation, you're empowering a women like these women that you just met to do better things, to do good things, things that they have the capability of doing and the desire to do, but without your help, they don't have the tools they need to do them. So thank you so much for making these stories possible. Um, these women's lives are truly changed through your support. And before I answer questions, I have one last slide. Um, what can you do now if you're wondering? A few things are listed here. You can sign up for our newsletter by visiting our website. You'll see on the right-hand side there's a really big place to sign up for the newsletter. So you can keep completely up to date on what we're doing and, um, and what work you are enabling by supporting us. You can connect with us on social media. We put lots of interesting information on social media. Um, some things that are smaller or just more frequent that don't wind up in our newsletter, you can keep up with us there and find out what we're doing. And on YouTube, we have great videos all the time for you to watch and, and just meet some of the people, hear their voices, um, to find out what's, what's happening and what they're doing and how you're improving their lives. And finally, and most importantly, I think, um, you can make more of these stories possible. And right now, you can make double the stories possible because right now, our board of directors is matching every gift that comes in through December 31st, dollar for dollar. So if you give a $20 gift, they'll match at $20, and you will have given a $40 gift, um, even though you wrote a check for $20. Um, same goes for any amount until we reach that mark of $143,000, every gift you give will be matched. So it will help twice as many women go twice as far in the fight against poverty. So there is no better time to give than when there is a match like this. And this number is big. Last year we had a $100,000 match. And with your help, we did make that match. But we have an even bigger number this year, and we need your help to meet it. So. Please give today. You can see the URL on your screen. Just type that into your internet browser. Um, it's simple. It just takes two minutes to make a gift or um, send in a check, whatever way you prefer. But please know that you can make more stories possible. You have made these stories possible. But we need your help to reach more people. So thank you. So now um, I'm going to get to answering some questions. Looks like I've got a few minutes for it. Somebody asked, how can I get involved with Grameen Foundation? Well, if you are a donor, you are already involved with Grameen Foundation. And please know that that's very important involvement. Oh, I'm just seeing more of the question. I'm a social work major. So again, if you're a donor, please know that you're making this work possible. You are involved. You're part of the Grameen family, so thank you. If you'd like to get more involved, you can sign up to volunteer through Bankers Without Borders. That is our volunteer initiative. Um, I think it's bankerswithoutborders.com, but you can Google it if I'm wrong. I believe that's it. And you can sign up there to volunteer um, your time, and they'll match your skills with the volunteer project that's a good fit for you. Um, so that's a great way to get involved as well. Um, another question here, when or where on your trip were you the most inspired by what you saw? Um, I think, again, I think in Uganda, seeing the CKW work was really, really inspirational. Um, it was, again, all the programs seemed so effective and people were so, so happy, but the CKW program was especially fun to visit because people were so thrilled with their community knowledge worker. Um, these are just community members who are helping their neighbors, and everyone looks up to them. Um, they're leaders in other ways. So we met some women who work at um, domestic violence shelters and, and do other work in their community. They might serve on a local government council. So they're really inspiring leaders, and they are 
changing their neighbors' lives. And it's such, such a good feeling to see these communities working together and see that this really basic information that, again, we take for granted is making such a difference in these people's lives. Um, so again, all, everything I saw was really inspirational, but I think that was um, leaving, leaving those, those farmers in Uganda just gave you so much hope and such a good feeling about the future for these people. Uh, what were people's attitudes about me as a visitor and foreigner? Um, people were extremely gracious and rolling out the red carpet. Um, I showed you that photo of Florence with all those mangoes. If somebody could send us away with a small gift or a cup of tea, they would. Um, it was really, really wonderful. Some people were a little bit shy um, to have somebody they don't know come and ask them all these questions. So understandably, they were a bit shy. But overwhelmingly, everybody was gracious and, and just so kind and warm and um, so glad to tell us their story. So it was really, really wonderful. What seemed to be the greatest need in the areas I visited? Um, that's a great question. I think the greatest need, um, and there are so many needs, you know, just banks and, and health clinics and silt roads, so many needs, um, schools. But I think the biggest need is really connectivity. I think all of the communities that I visited know what they're missing. They know what other communities have. Um, they're connected enough with the world to know what they're missing, and they would like to bring these services and, and tools into their community. And they just don't have a way. So that made me particularly proud to be representing Grameen Foundation because what we're doing in, in all of these areas is helping connect people to um, information and services that they've been isolated from just because of geography for so many years. So I think getting people connected, giving people tools and, and the power to bring about changes in their own lives and communities is what will make a better future for Africa and for the developing world more generally. Um, so I think that's the biggest need, just getting empowering people with, with tools and information that will let them climb their own way out of poverty. How has my outlook changed since going on my trip is another question. Thank you for your questions. Please keep submitting them um, with the chat window on your screen. Um, my outlook has changed a lot since my trip. I don't think I mentioned it at the beginning of, um, of this, this live chat, and I wish I had. I had never been to Africa, and I really hadn't been to developing countries very much at all before I took this trip. So spending two or three weeks um, in such a different environment changed me a lot. It changed my perspective a lot. Um, it made me very aware of the things I take for granted. Working at Grameen Foundation, I have been aware all this time that I'm really fortunate to have an education and a computer and internet access and so many things. But I don't often think about how lucky I am to have running water to wash my dishes in every day and things like that. So my perspective was changed a lot, just knowing that there are a lot of people making do with much less in this world and that they are so optimistic and hardworking. Um, it's a little harder to complain now because, because I know how fortunate I am and, and my family and my friends and, and many of the people I know here in my country. Um, even when we think we have it hard, we, we have it pretty easy and um, there are a lot of people working with a lot less who are making the most of it, for sure. Do I have local government approval for the, pro or do we have local government approval for the programs in these countries? And that's a question from Jack. That's a great question. Um, as I mentioned in Ghana, we actually work with the Ghana Health Service, which is the national health care service. So yes, um, in that case we do. And in all cases we do. Um, in Zambia, Zona is, is a legitimate business, and it's actually a for-profit business with the social goal of reaching the poor with financial services, but um, they have all the proper licenses and registrations that any business has to have. In Uganda, yes, we're working with, again, legitimate companies like Airtel and Barclays, and our CKW program is, is definitely government approved, and um, 
we may in the future even have an opportunity to work with the government there um, to extend the CKW program to even more people. So yes, in all cases, um, we do have government approval or awareness, and we are very much working within the laws of these countries. Um, we also operate in Nigeria, India, the Philippines, Colombia, um, many other countries, and of course we are keeping everything um, legal and kosher and up to government standards as much as we can, or not as much as we can, definitely, um, to be sure that, that we can continue offering services without any problems. That's a good question. Let's see. Um, who did I meet whose life was changed the most by Grameen Foundation's work? I'm actually going to back up a little bit and show you a photo I didn't really stop on. And this is Lucy. Lucy is another CKW client. So she's a farmer and she has a community knowledge worker who visits her um, and, and helps her on her farm. Lucy had a... Um, a really sweet story. So many places we went, um, my colleagues and I, so many places we went, we saw that women were working very hard and men were not working, sometimes at all, unfortunately. And that's a big generalization, but it was a common thing that we saw. But when we came to visit Lucy, she was just coming in off the fields and her husband came along about 15 minutes later from working in the field. So it was really sweet to see them working side by side, husband and wife, to, um, to build up their home and support their family. Lucy had seen a particularly big difference in her farm. I believe one of her crops, her earnings from that crop increased six times over what it had been before. So it was, it was a considerable difference and, and really elevated their income and it helped them pay school fees and, and take care of their family. Um, they lived in a very modest home, um, thatch roof, mud walls, pretty small, um, in a very, very remote area. We were able to park on a, a road, a very rural road, and we walked about 10 or 15 minutes to get to her home, um, just through farmland and bushes and trees. So it was, um, she was very remote and um, clearly working very, very hard when we drove up and was seeing such a big difference in her farm and it was clear that she had never had very much and that she was really excited to have a little more money to work with um, to help her family and she was hoping to build a better home for her family soon. Um, so I think she was one of the biggest success stories that we saw. Um, more questions. Um, let's see. It looks like we don't have many more questions, so um, I'll give you a couple more minutes to submit your questions. Um, and meanwhile, I'll go back a couple of slides and maybe just tell one more story because I've got a couple more minutes. One more story out of Zambia, actually. This is Robbie, and he is he owns a small store, as you can see behind him. And he is another Zona agent. So his store, in addition to selling things, is a Zona location where people can come um, send money or receive money, take out cash, deposit cash, etc. Um, and with Zona, you do have an account number with a PIN, or an account name, rather, with a PIN, so you can keep money in your account if you would like, like a bank account. So it's um, really a full service program. So Robbie was um, an anomaly. He was, he was a rare case where he actually wasn't really profiting from having Zona in his store, but he was offering Zona all the same because he knew it was really, really important for the people in his, in his community, the people who came to his store, to be able to send and receive money. And he knew that um, they didn't have another way to do this and that if he offered it in his store, he could help out his neighbors. So Ravi was, again, he was a rare story. Most people, it was profitable for them to have a Zona outlet kiosk, um, uh, a stand basically for Zona. 
Um, I think he's the only person we met who said it wasn't profitable for him, but yet he wanted to serve his community. He had lived there all his life. He found it was very important, and he continued to, um, to offer Zona, to offer these cash transactions and cashless transactions to the people in his community to help them, um, to help them be able to manage their finances better. So he was a, a, great, a great story and a great community member um, and a very nice man. So once again, um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm so glad you're here, and I'm so glad I get to tell you some of the stories of the people I met while I was on this trip. And again, in case I didn't stress it enough before, these stories are your stories. They're stories you make possible when you support Grooming Foundation. None of them would be possible without people like you who believe in these people and who know that they can do wonderful things and overcome their circumstances with a little bit of a hand up. So thank you for making it possible. Um, once again, we have a match right now going on by our board of directors. It's $143,000 and we need your help to make that match. Every dollar you give is matched dollar for dollar and we don't want one dollar of the match to go unclaimed. So please, please um, take advantage of the time right now. I think we'll end two minutes early, so that gives you two minutes to go online or write a check if you feel so inclined to continue supporting this work and making more stories possible. Thank you again. If you're staying up late or waking up early, wherever you are in the world, thank you for joining us.